Most of you have probably heard of the scientific method, and you probably had to memorize it at some point as well. But think about this. The scientific method, it's a process used by scientists to understand the natural world. So what exactly is the natural world again? Well, these elk here fighting in the sunset, that's part of the natural world. The natural world really includes anything in the universe that we can observe, measure, or test for. So scientific method. Remember, this is a process. It's not a strict list of directions that every scientist must follow. But like I said, it's a process. And science begins with making observations. you got to observe the world around you. Sometimes to make an observation, we need a really fancy piece of equipment, like this large radio telescope that forms part of the VLA. These will allow us to see radio waves from deep space. And starting next year, the James Webb Space Telescope, that thing is going to be enormous and is many times more powerful than the Hubble Space Telescope. But to make these observations, it's taking expensive and cutting edge technology to do so. So they don't have to be limited to what we can see with our own eyes. So scientific method, you have to start by making observations. And now from making those observations, you can start to ask questions. But science takes us a step further. We ask a question and then we formulate them as a testable hypothesis. And uh, there's me right there formulating a testable hypothesis one afternoon or actually at night when I was in Honduras. Over the centuries, science has really changed a lot. The process of doing science has changed and our knowledge has changed as well. One of the very first examples of really good science was almost 2200 years ago when a Greek philosopher named Aristosthenes, he thought that the world was round and he actually went out and tested his hypothesis. What he noticed was that a post at a certain time of day cast a shadow in Alexandria. But he learned at the same time of day, another post to the south of him in Syene did not cast a shadow. So what he realized was that to explain the difference in the size of the shadows, one not casting a shadow and one casting a shadow, he goes, you know what? I think the world must be round. So he walked off the distance between Alexandria and the town of Syene, and then he used some simple geometry. And Eratosthenes, in 2200 years ago, or actually about 250 BC, he actually calculated the circumference of the earth to within a few hundred miles. That was an astounding feat for the time. At that point, he actually fairly well disproved the flat earth hypothesis, except it was so contrary to popular beliefs, anecdotal data, and common sense knowledge that nobody believed him. However, Let's jump ahead a few hundred years, actually about 1700, 1800 years. And Ferdinand Magellan, he actually led a crew that sailed around the world, proving once and for all that the earth is actually round. Now a little bit about this, uh, Ferdinand didn't actually make it back. He died in the Philippines as part of a war. They started out with 267 men and three boats and only 18 survived to make the trip back. This picture of the Earth taken in 1972 shows once and for all that the Earth is round. So our knowledge has gone from a flat Earth to knowing that the Earth is round as a fact. And that's how scientific knowledge changes. So here it is. Science begins with making observations and asking questions. But science takes us a little bit further the next step is scientists formulate testable hypothesis. Now a hypothesis, you may have learned it as an educated guess. That is not the case. Don't call it that. A scientific hypothesis is a proposed explanation for a set of observations or it makes some type of prediction of your experiment or what you're going to observe. Remember, it's not just an educated guess. A good hypothesis has at least two qualities. One is, it's potentially testable. It might be expensive to test. It might be unethical to test. It might be out of the realm of our abilities with our current state of technology. But at least you have an idea of how you could potentially test your hypothesis. And it's potentially falsifiable. Not every hypothesis will be falsified. 
but there should be at least some type of evidence that could potentially falsify it. So remember, a scientific hypothesis should be at least potentially testable and potentially falsifiable. Now, whenever we go out to test a hypothesis, what we want to do is we want to conduct either observations or an experiment. The whole idea here is we're gathering data because we're going to either accept our hypothesis or we're going to reject our hypotheses. Experiments and observations or observational studies both have their benefits and their drawbacks. Sometimes, for example, we can't really do a manipulated experiment on somebody because it's just not ethical. Here's my dad. He's at the candy bar aisle. And it may not be an ethical experiment to actually go out and test whether or not candy bars cause you to gain weight. And in fact, there's a whole lot of evidence that shows that our health is correlated with our diet and exercise. But, you know, designing an experiment where you say, okay, I'm gonna take 100 people and you're gonna go eat diet so or drink diet sodas, eat pizza and hamburgers every day, and another group of 100 people are going to exercise 30 minutes every day and eat vegetables. Well, that might sound like a good experiment, and it would be, except that it's unethical because the people eating the junk food, that would be detrimental to their health. So it's not very ethical to do an experiment on them. So what we do is observational experiments. In this case, we test our hypothesis by tracking people and we follow their health statistics and like uh, body weight, blood pressure, cholesterol, things like this, and we correlate that with their diet. Observational experiments are commonly used in understanding the correlations between diet, exercise, and health. So for example, you may have heard of the Mediterranean diet and that people that follow the Mediterranean diet often live a long time. Now here's a limitation of a observational study. So we haven't actually exactly manipulated the diets of people. So there could be other reasons out there that people on the Mediterranean diet live longer. For example, let's say people on the Mediterranean diet, they just walk more. Well, we know that walking is also correlated with better health. So people that eat poorly may be walking less. People that eat healthy may be walking more. And it could be the walking that's important, or it could be both the walking, which is the exercise, and the diet, which are both important for our long-term health. So the limitation of the observational experiment is we may not get at exactly what is causing longer health. One thing we have to be careful of is anecdotal data. It does not necessarily prove a hypothesis. And in fact, scientists don't really try to prove their hypothesis. They try to disprove them. There's been a lot of talk out there about vitamin C and how it prevents us from getting a cold. If you've ever gone through the line at Smith's or Walmart or Walgreens or CVS, you may have come across emergency. The idea is you take this and it will help prevent you from getting a cold or it might make the duration of your cold last less. Well, lots of observational studies have failed to support any notion that taking large amounts of vitamin C prevents us from getting a cold or makes them last um, less time. So the point is the data don't support any type of vitamin C taking colds. We would call that anecdotal data. If somebody tells you it works, well, if I took vitamin C for three months, I never caught a cold, I would say, hey, anecdotal data, it worked. I didn't catch a cold. But how often do you really catch colds? For me, it's been about two years. So that anecdotal data would not be conclusive in any way in supporting the role of vitamin C in preventing colds. In addition to doing observational experiments, one of the most powerful ways to test our hypothesis is to design an experiment. And when we design an experiment, we manipulate a variable and we measure the response of another variable. And in this little cartoon right here, it looks like she's manipulating temperature and measuring the growth of plants. So you better stand back. We're gonna start doing science here. In our fast-paced society, a lot of us don't have time to eat healthy or to exercise as much as we need to. And there's always some new miracle weight loss pill that's out there that says, hey, take this and you'll look like this person on the cover. So they're thinking that's going to cause you to lose weight. 
Well, to determine whether or not these pills actually work, we can design an experiment. The first thing we're going to do is design some hypotheses. We're going to come up with a null hypothesis and several alternative hypotheses. The null hypothesis is basically the hypothesis of no effect. What that means is the weight loss pill would have no effect on your weight. You're not going to gain any, you're not going to lose any. So Eric Cartman here would stay looking the same. An alternative hypothesis would be, okay, it can cause significant weight loss. Now hold on to that word significant because we're going to come back to what that actually means. And another alternative hypothesis is that the pill could cause significant weight gain. And like I said, hold on to that word significant because it has specific meaning in science. So here's how we're going to test whether or not this pill causes weight loss. We're going to get two groups of people. We're going to have a control group and the experimental group. Each one is going to have 100 people. That is our sample size. And the control group, we're going to give the placebo. And the experimental group, they're going to give the weight loss pill. Now under ideal circumstances, we're going to control how much they eat and how much they exercise. We can't always do that. So the larger the, your sample size, the more people you have, the better your results are going to be. We have two different types of variables, the independent variable and the dependent variable. In this case, we're manipulating the pill and we're going to measure the weight. That's our dependent variable because we're going to say weight loss depends on the pill. Well, you would go and weigh all of your subjects at the beginning of the experiment. You would run it for a few months, however long you wanted to, and then at the end, you would reweigh them and then collect and analyze the data. So here's our experiment. Whether or not it's an observational experiment or a manipulated experiment, we are collecting data and we are going to analyze it. And then we'll use that data to determine whether or not we accept or reject our hypotheses. When we collect our data, that's the empirical data. That are the actual numbers that we collected. For example, person number one lost five pounds, person number two, lost 4.6 pounds. We call that the empirical data, and it's the information gathered by the experiment. One of the most important things about scientists and doing science is that after we've made our observations, asked our questions, developed our hypothesis, run our experiments, and collected our data, we use that data after we've analyzed it to develop our conclusions. And we use that data to whether or not we're gonna reject our hypothesis or accept our hypothesis. And that can be difficult because sometimes the data goes against what we believe. But in science, we use that data to form our conclusions. And then we start the process over again. If our data don't conform to our hypothesis, we redefine our hypothesis and we go out and collect more data. So science is an iterative process. And because it's done over and over and over again, it's repeatable it's also self-correcting as well. In the next section, we're going to talk about statistics. How do we know that the weight loss pill actually work or, or cause you to lose weight? How do we tell if it's random noise? Is it just a random chance that it causes the differences in the two groups? Or is it actually the effect of the pill? So statistics are very, very important for allowing us to interpret our data.